Thank you for the introduction and, and thanks for everyone to uh for for uh, connecting. That's that's amazing to uh to have that many people uh, uh curious at least about AI. Uh and I know some of you already are pretty familiar with it, so I hope uh, you will still learn a few things. I'm going to share my screen uh and get started. There you go. There you go. All right, Josh is working. Perfect. So um I hope I would have time to uh, go uh, around everything. There's a lot of things to say, but so I initially called this a deep dive into the AI generative image landscape. Um, it turns out it's more of an incomplete, but hopefully partly relevant, deeper dive into the text to image landscape. Um, I like the joke because uh, uh, it's still uh, relevant. It's guaranteed to likely be less than 50% relevant uh, by the end of this presentation. Uh, you know, the AI landscape is moving so fast. so. A lot of learnings, a lot of things. I uh, hope some of those uh, findings can still stay relevant over time, but the technology is sure moving forward. Uh, so my name is Henry. I spelled it in here. As you can see, this, those are actual screenshots of uh, all the times my name was um, misspelled or uh, butchered over any kind of email or correspondence. So that's something I had to collect. So now I have like, a huge folder of all of those. Um, I am, as you can hear, uh, a French speaker, or originally from Belgium, living in Salt Lake City, Utah for the last uh, two years now. Actually, today, exceptionally in LA, uh, as we had to uh, renew my wife's passport. So life happened. Um, moving forward, so my main role is as CEO and CTO at a company called Doc Studio Depth. Uh, originally just Doc Studio, we joined uh, uh, Debt, uh, which is a much larger uh, holding based in Netherlands, uh, two years ago now. Um, as I said, I was uh, uh, born in Belgium, and um, for the last two years, I've been spending, spending quite some time uh, uh, diving into AI. It, was, it really felt like a, a positive, but still a bottomless pit of uh, information, uh, which is uh, both amazing and sometimes a bit scary. Um, about us and, and in a nutshell, what we are doing is uh, as a company, it's focusing on the experiential stuff. Uh, it's not really far from, from uh, what jo Josh, uh, Josh's team is doing uh, amazingly well, um, except we are a bit less in the physical space, uh, a lot more purely digital, but a lot of real time 3D, a lot of innovation, a lot of venturing into new tech. Uh, and this has been our brand and butter for years. And AI is becoming one big topic for us, which is pretty exciting. Um, our focus and before moving to the next part is like into leaving a mark and leaving a mark is something which, and besides so stupid jokes, which I, I love, uh, that's part of the Belgian uh, touch. Um, this is something which we feel is important and, and, and to go back to, to you, Josh, I think a lot of your business is about that, you know, like um, when you want people to experience something, you want them to remember, you want them to, uh, to feel something. And AI is amazing right now because whether people like it or not they are reacting to it and that's a pretty interesting time uh, we have before this is just embedded in society and we just forget it even is a thing um and just keep the the sharila there you go um so i guess some of you are really technical people so i i don't want to offense anyone so if i oversimplify some technical aspects uh um i'm sorry um i'm i think pretty uh, comfortable with you know mixing tools and leveraging those tools, um, but obviously built by people who are much smarter than I am. So to get started, and, and for those who are less familiar, what is generative AI? Uh, that's a big question. At the same time, I know most of you are uh, pretty familiar, but if we have to really summarize, it's uh, leveraging techniques such as deep learning and your network to learn underlying patterns in the training data. and we know that's a lot of the topic right now, a lot of the, the conversations over the legal side as well. Like, what does it mean training data? Is it like akin to how human beings are, are learning? Uh, can we really compare? Does it make any sense? Uh, does, is there a bias? So there's a lot of things around this, um, but the bottom line is that uh, we can mimic uh, a kind of learning process and this is what we are interested in. So the big question is, so do you care? What's interesting is that I gave this talk minor uh, minus a few modifications a few months ago and uh i think the more i do and the least this question uh gets relevant because like obviously i think most of you um still just 
the news how um, AI is reshaping a lot of industries as we speak, uh, both in the, the the right way and the wrong way. And wrong way because uh, despite a lot of people think it's not going to replace jobs or <clears throat> that AI is going to generate more jobs than than it's going to take, I really agree. I think that it's just going to displace um, and to redistribute uh, wealth globally and in a way which is sometimes going to be awful. But bottom line is, as everyone says, there's no way we can put back the genie in a bottle. It's just going to happen. So a lot of industries are going to look into it. Hopefully some are going to be more positive, but it's also a lot of noise. Um, it's difficult to uh, to cut through all of this. And there's uh, this, this saying which comes over and over again, which is that humans with uh, AI are most likely going to replace humans without AI. And I guess sometimes you, AI is just going to replace humans despite what extremely positive people say. Um, so to get back in the, in how this happened and, and what kind of background I have in this and why I think it's relevant. So um, I want to get back in time. Um, so for the last two years, I've been spending quite some time uh, diving into AI. Actually, I forgot about this slide. Um, and there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of information. Um, as I said, it can be overwhelming at times. Um, but so for me, the first actual experience where like, oh, this is interesting, which if some of you have been in the field for like a lot longer can be um, annoying to hear, like because it's fairly recent. It's uh, December, 2021. Uh, knowing that some some of you might have been uh, leveraging some kind of AI for like a decade already, um, but it started for me with generating uh, images through a text to um, to image, um, which was uh, a tool called uh, Wombo, which I think is still around. Wombo Dream as an application. Um, back then, it was something called VQ GAN plus Clip, which is a certain way to generate visuals. Uh, VQGAN is the, the, the V for vector. So as you can see, there's, a, there's something which is also extremely geometric, extremely really like vector in the way it's done. And I was really like fully blown away, although like those look like approximation of people by the fact that we could generate something which is really compelling and gives me a mood. And um, that was like, I would say the first experience and I spent quite some time uh, working with it. I fast forward, January, 2022, which is not that much forward. Discovered something called Google Collab. Never heard of it before. It's been around for a while um, because people were implementing uh, libraries, and in this case, Jax Diffusion and Disco Diffusion. Um, and so, you know, what, what the fuck is Jax and Disco Diffusion? It's, it's just weird names. Um, so I started diving into those weird notebooks where everything is made to be complicated, where we have all those um uh, parameters i had no idea what was doing what you had to wait like an hour to get a visual but that was interesting like i was back i, I had a feeling it was back to those early days of 3d where you have to wait hours to have a render i mean you still have to wait hours but like for anything it was hours um and then like uh, you know like spending time on twitter speaking to people understanding what parameters do and what kind of influence you get um I will explain exactly how Jax Diffusion is working and Disco Diffusion, but if you really want to know, there's a link here which I can share afterwards explaining how diffusion models in general um, uh, work. But all in all, the process is you start with an approximation of a certain amount of noise in the picture. Uh, by you, so you say, I want to see like a tower or a background of whatever. So you describe what you want. And then um, it's going to start with the noise. And then there's another part of the algorithm, which is going to look at it and say, mm, not exactly what I was asking. And so the, say, the first part we generate is going to keep on uh, refreshing and take out noise to try to uh, refine the output. And that's how you get converge an actual picture. As you can see, there's already a huge difference in two months between what uh, VQGAN could do to, to this. So super exciting, difficult, but rewarding as well, because you start to get into this kind of a you know painterly feeling, which to me is interesting because then, you're blending uh, what we call traditional art, I would say, or like a landscape that we thought we know into digital. Um, and then we move forward. So I'm going to to uh, accelerate, but so February 9, we have uh, something which was called the journey, which started. Uh, here you can see the same prompt from V1 to V3. I cannot skip them all because I, I, and that's personal, I had the feeling that everything looked exactly the same. Uh, like there was a kind of a, um, aesthetic coming with the images of the first versions of Midjourney, And that was, I don't know, I thought annoying because everyone was producing the same images. So I kind of keep this up together. Um, OpenAI released DALI 2. Uh, so no more collab notebooks. First 
real good version, I think, of uh, of being able to generate uh, visuals or pictures, which actually look like pictures of people. Uh, a lot of limitations. It, it couldn't handle painterly or like illustrative style at all. But as you can see, it, it was weird. But that was that was like a big change. Um, and then a guy called Emad, never heard of him before, reached out one day on Twitter to use his new AI tool called um, Table Diffusion. I honestly thought it was spam. So I got this, this message, which I left it, uh, left it in my mailbox afterward, after 2022 20, uh, for like a month. Um, what's interesting is that Stable Diffusion is now one of the biggest players, and I fully ignore that. But then I started seeing on my timeline things pop up, which I thought was were really interesting, and then decided to dive into it. So those are things that I generated back then. I spent way too much time creating images. I love how the first versions were amazing at doing a kind of impressionist style and surrealism. So that was just a gold mine. And you could see that we were like a cornerstone and that Gen AI would never be the same. Um, this is basically the feed of my of my phone at some point. So that was, that was ridiculous. Um, and then mid uh evolved, got to V4, improved to V5, V3.1. I mean, now with V6, uh, it's impressive how far they went. It also opened a lot of it's a whole kind of worms now regarding obviously copyright and legal uh, information. I'm going to come back on it later, but also in terms of uh, how interesting it is if you represent reality with such precision, is it still um, interesting in terms of storytelling, right? Like, are you still saying something interesting because you can make it technically accurate? Like photography can do that, but if you don't have a point of view, does it really matter? Um, so we have this ecosystem now today between open AI, stability, uh, mid journey, uh, Adobe with Firefly, uh, which has its, its you know benefits or and and also defects. But uh, bottom line is a lot of the market is divided between these players today, and each of those images have been generated with the different services. So to close on the on the the flashback, as of today, and my experience on this, I generated around actually it's even more now. If I would say more like eighty thousand images on mid journey only. Um, a lot of it is noise. A lot of it is not worth even you know doing anything with. Um, my work as an artist, uh, leveraging AI, has been exhibited in, in a lot of different places, from LA to Milan to Tokyo, or Belgium. Uh, I'm part of a leading group of artists uh, leveraging AI, trying to get heard by the U.S. Congress because there's obviously a lot of uh, really vibrant voices from angry artists, which I get like people who are part of the training data. But on the flip side, I saw a lot of artists who are traditional artists who love using AI and, and are turning this into their own thing as well, and they would like to be heard as well. Um, I said to invest and advise several art um, AI-driven companies. I think it's pretty pretty, pretty amazing what, what they're doing. And uh, lately got started by a talent management agency in New York. And I think, um, Josh, you, you, uh, you, you're not... Uh, uh, You've been part of this uh, in, in some capacity, uh, so so thank you for that. All right, and so since then, uh, this is part of the work I've been I've been doing, um, which as you can see can go in a lot of different ways, and this is what I love about AI that you can create aesthetics which um, have never been seen, or like mixing a lot of different uh, aspects and without being limited by, um, which in a way is good and sad, but like spending a decade trying to refine a, a, a style. Um, so the, the curation aspect to me and the purely art direction aspect are, are taking over uh, some, some other traditional uh, uh, constraints you would have, which I think is fascinating, but which can also, I think, make some people pretty angry. So I'm back. Um, so what's the point of all of that? You have two sides to this. You have the artist on one side, you have the designer, and then basically you do you. Um, there's no, I don't think there's a real uh, good answer, there's a real good direction, but there's a few things I noticed over time and I would like to share them with you. And I hope it's going to be uh, helpful in, in some capacity. The first one, which is, and obviously and hopefully you got my title was pretty uh, sarcastic, but no, it's not just about pressing a button, but it can be. Also, you can just put a prompt and press a button and then just hope that something good is going to come out of it. Um, the landscape is complicated. And quite frankly, I could even update it now with a few more players. But there are a lot of tools out there. And they all have different uh, uh, possibilities. And you're going to leverage them for different reasons. 
I mentioned four players for text to image, but then you have upscalers. One major one is missing now. You have um, software to train your own models uh, without code for some. Uh, you have all the cloud GPU things because obviously we don't all have uh, big NVIDIA uh, graphic cards at home or like we're working on Mac, for example, like my, uh, in my case. But bottom line is that you have to be able to juggle all of that. And this is where it starts to be interesting. So uh, for example, this is a workflow we calibrate for some projects where you're going to start doing concepting of a journey and exploring. It's really like the same as sketching. So obviously I would say this is a step zero, which is you, have, you need an ID. You just don't play around. But if you have something clear in your mind, you want like a, a start of an ID, you can start opening it. Then you can do some model training with stable diffusion uh, on Leonardo using Metro image and control net. You can go back to Photoshop using Firefly for some photo bashing, in painting or painting, retouching. Um, you can uh, use Run Diffusion, which allows you to do, it's a cloud GPU, so you, you'll be able to do what we call latent upscaling. So upscale and add details in painting and fine tuning. You can go back to Procreate afterwards to repaint whatever you don't like. Go go back to, to Photoshop to do some retouching and then animate, for example, with Pika Labs or Runway or whatever. So there are a lot of different ways to uh, um, to do this, um, but basically that's just a framework, and there's like tons thousands of options uh, on how you can uh, you can mix that uh, one way or another. So um, that's a, a visual I, I uh, created a few months ago, and the workflow you saw before is basically what uh, got into this. Um, that's just an example, but it's interesting. Or indeed, you can just press a button, but also you can make so many different tools to get um, something which might be more interesting or more or, or more rich, depending on what you try to achieve. Um, lately, I've been generating um, totally new uh, kind of a universe. Uh, it's a new workflow. It's it's some of those tools, the other tools which are added, like uh, for example, um, there's an upscaler called Magnific, which started a few months ago, which is amazing. It's basically what I was doing in Run Diffusion, but it saves me a lot of time and, and, and having to boot a, a web GPU for just for that. Um, but there's ways to get around it, but it comes down to how much work you want to put into this and what you want to tell and how consistent you want to be uh, in your body of work as well. Um, which gets me to the next point. Uh, this is not just another tool. Uh, that's that's one big one. Oh, sorry, this is just another tool. Uh, and the thing is like most people, really get angry about it, thinking that it's everything. It's not everything. It's just something you need to use. Um, and um, Sigburn, uh, you are also a tool. Um, that's how we are. We're just uh, another cog in the machine. We've been doing digital art for decades now, and this is not something new. Um, so an example, when I started with the VQ GAN thing uh, a few slides ago, um, that's what I started building. Like, okay, the output is not exactly what I want, but I see potential into uh, cutting some pieces of those visuals and then recomposing them to create stories. So I uh, started a, a series about uh, famous characters from the uh, literature. So um, you had for example, Dorian Gray in here. Uh, you had um, obviously Edgar Allan Poe in here. And so, I started working on those different um, uh, series, but it is bringing, cutting elements, bring them in Photoshop, recutting, reassembling, retouching, and then getting the outputs. And that's the way to do it. And this is where AI can be interesting. Um, I'm going to come back on her later, but an artist who's doing this uh, extremely well over years. She's an amazing artist by herself, but then she used AI just as a part of a process uh, to generate assets, which is um, reusing afterwards. Another project back then, using vintage pictures, uh, doing countless generations to transform them, and then reassembling everything, uh, like basically rebuilding the puzzle in a different way to get exactly what I want uh, from this. Um, and then more of that. This is um, Jack Diffusion, which I mentioned before, same process for the bashing element, getting getting uh, pieces. Sometimes once I have something I like, I rerun it for the AI, because that's what's amazing sometimes with uh, some of those tools that they can blend even better some elements. So if you do some Photoshop modifications and you rerun it, it's going to really bake your modification modification into the final image, which is pretty cool. Um, another process, at some point I had a series about uh, a character which uh, uh, I wanted to uh, explore. 
And um, I used a simple iPad uh, software where like you can just build your own character, like a few a few taps, uh, and then you can put it in a in pose. And so I would do the posing, um, extract a PNG, and then start doing generations once again, um, and then build those stories where I use this AI output, uh, which has been partly 3D, partly photo bashed into other elements which were generated. And so it enabled me, and it was already two years ago, one year and a half to for some of them um, to explore the universe and to push it further and to create uh, 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 more. And so it's the same character. So um, consistency, for example, is difficult with AI, but then there's ways to get around it. You can just use assets which are really consistent, and then it's the way you apply them and uh, the way you rework it. Um, next point. Um, get a lot of anger around AI. That's nothing uh, surprising, I guess. Sorry, um, no one, I mean, I think no one has the answer yet, but like a lot of people need just to, to chill uh, on both sides, both the AI side or the pro AI and the ones who are against. So this is a controversy. So we're going to uh, get directly into it so not to uh, lose uh, uh, too much time. Um, there's a lot of lawsuits which are uh, hanging. So stable diffusion at some point, uh, still now, I think, uh, from different players, uh, Mijoni has one so, uh, as well. So. The bottom line is that the legal frame is the, the models are, are being built, as you know, I guess, on, on, on scraping data. And the issue is that the data which is used is a big black box. And also, once it's already used in the model, there's no way you cannot really unfold it and just look what's being used to train it. Um, also, a lot of misconceptions. So, for example, the first um, lawsuit last year was all part of the, the, uh, the trial was about the fact that the images were stored somewhere, like no images were not stored somewhere. Like this is like so much data, you can just store images. So that's all, it's so technical that I think lawyers are really like confused. It's difficult to get into it, understand how it works. But also it opens an entire new field. Like indeed, is it learning the way humans do? Can you actually put copyright on this on both sides? Does it make sense? Um, is the fact that they can replicate the style of an artist, is, is, is it stealing from the, that artist? Knowing that also, uh, I think the past has been proven that you cannot uh, copyright a method. So is it part of this? Does it does it work? So a lot of things happened last year. You were had at some point our station artists uh, said they didn't want uh, to uh, be part of this. Uh, recently, I think Nightshade, which is uh, I think it's a Chicago University, started a, a process to enable artists to poison images so they can be used for training data. What's fun, I should put it in the, in the presentation. I saw last week that, uh, oh, see. Um, I saw last week that um, that wasn't working so far. So they're like saying, hey, this is going to work. Now you can poison your own images and then um, they cannot script the data anymore. Turns out that apparently it improved <laughs> That's funny, yeah. the generations using uh, poison pictures so far is better than without it. So I would say thank you for that. I guess they're going to figure it out, but um, that's not really working out. But so all of this to say that no one really knows um, the frame around that. We can skip. Yeah, it's legally it's a big kind of worms. Um, I had a few months ago a conversation with a major brand about that and with lawyers directly, and they not only they didn't have like a clear answer because I think obviously no one knows, but also indeed the technical aspects were really. I heard a lot of misinterpretation and cases of what, what happened. And, and um, at some point, there was a, ba a Balenciaga branded video with uh, Harry Potter, which went around. People actually thought it was from Balenciaga. Lawyers thought it was from Balenciaga. It wasn't. So there's a lot of things which is around it. So it's it's so difficult. The second part of it, which is uh, another issue, is that uh, people are just too nervous and, and don't make any sense. Uh, you have people leveraging AI uh, who are saying, hey, look, I got much better what I'm doing. Except in this case, if you can, it may, most likely there'd be some kind of tooling, but it's also a lot attached to um, the model they're using. Most likely, person just change model at some point and then got different results. Uh, that's not really smart to basically uh, uh, be extremely proud about it and like publicly say, "Hey, look, I just got better," and you said that I didn't. But also, you have constantly people um, really being AI angry. So a lot of traditional artists uh, saying, "Hey, you have to pick up a pencil." Turn out a lot of People leveraging AI are actually extremely good artists and just decided to leverage uh, those tools. I'm going to show a few of them afterwards. So the bottom line is that we just have people complaining and arguing. And I, I guess it never has been 
as different and it's just getting worse. Um, so this is for example, if I put AI art dev credits, um, it's just like a quick scroll, but that got that bad and that's still that bad. And over the last two months, uh, I think, I don't know how many times I got people saying, hey, I love your art, it's amazing. And then two comments and there someone who's going to say, I think it's AI because it's not even sure, which I get because now it's starting to be difficult to make the difference. And someone going at some point say, it's AI. And then the first person who said they loved it were like, oh, I feel so cheated, I hate it, and this is AI trash. And that's most of the debate. And by the way, nothing is really hidden, like my bio is clear I'm using AI. So people just have this kind of a reaction right now, regardless of if they actually like the art or not, which is crazy. A few solutions to move forward on, on that point, better compensation models for data training. Uh, I think Adobe is looking into it. Uh, more transparency towards training, uh, adapting regulations to fit uh, reality and not just in the black box right now, a lot of people doing regulations have no idea what's going on. Uh, listen to everyone, uh, including people who are using the tools and just chill. Uh, so we'll see where it goes. Uh, this is still relevant after a few months, but uh, but you'll see. Um, on time. All right, I'm sorry, I'm zooming through it because there's so many things to say. It should be all right. Next point is about finding your own voice. And um, which can be tricky when you're using AI because obviously, as, as I mentioned before, you can open so many doors. And also the most important one is don't be in the creep. Uh, this became a thing over the last year. When I say it became a thing, it became really a big thing. I, I did notice there were entire subreddits uh, over the kind of content. So obviously it pleases some people, but there's other ways to use this and this is going to be used as well as a, as a ammo by people who are uh, against AI. Um, but so a few artists, in case you didn't know them, um, I mentioned her before. So uh, Jenny, uh, for example, is a uh, uh, Nordic artist. Um, she is using AI to generate assets, which is, she then reuses in photo bashing and then repainting uh, uh, over and over again. Um, she now, I mean, it's been for a while now, but she, she built a pretty good name for herself. She's been exhibited in a lot of places, a uh, lot of recognition uh, getting into her work. She's amazing. So amazing at uh, drawing ends. And it's funny, it really became a thing. Uh, so this is not AI, this is purely patience and and, and uh, drawing by yourself, but she has a style, which is super obvious. Uh, and which she built over time. Um, another one, uh, Pel Kirill, no idea of uh, their real name. Uh, but among other work, I know that uh, their process is involving doing generations and then transforming the generation into a, a kind of style. But that's uh, their storytelling aspect to each of them, uh, some recurring themes. And this is just interesting. And you cannot argue this is, you know, this is not art. Uh, Francine, Francine is actually an oil painter. Uh, she's Dutch. Uh, she's been doing great at, at oil painting for years. She's been super interested into AI, started doing work with the same themes, she, she has uh, a body of work, a screening of uh, uh, older people uh, in, in a lot of it, uh, but now she's transforming this and bringing into AI as well. Uh, but some of the training she's doing is leveraging the work she's doing in oil, which is great use as well. Um, Evelyn, Sam, they are doing this kind of a collage thing, which are extremely unique, uh, something really uh, um, rough about their approach. Once again, you cannot argue this is not unique. You cannot look at it and be like, oh, this is the artist. You know, I, I know that this is being you know stolen or the training that I that abuse because all of this work is so transformative that you cannot really isolate. And this is where it's fascinating. Another one is a, a rope. Um let's pronounce rope, rope. Um actually uh, became really big over time. I'm pretty sure, uh, pretty sure Joshua really knew him, uh, know him. Um he had major exhibitions lately, lately in Paris, actually at the, uh, which is interesting, at the photography fair. Um, this is one of his series about America, but it's interesting how he embraces the AI and the fact that, obviously, as you can see, a lot of things are broken. But that's part of the, the pleasure, it's part of the aesthetic, part of the work to create a, a mood, uh, which is going to make you feel something without trying actually to replicate. It's more, it's his own thing, right? Um, Ilya, Sam. I think it's the last one I put uh, for now. Lydia is a traditional uh, artist, oil painter, uh, who's also using his oil painting to train his own models and then 
reusing the models to um, to generate and then choose what he likes best. And then sometimes reprinting and repainting on top uh, all of that. So, I mean, there's like so many possibilities, but it's amazing because you can you can indeed find your own voice. And the last point on that is that only results matter, I, regardless of, of where you get. Um, so for example, some people get obsessed about uh, models saying, oh, there's a new version of the model, I have to use it. Not really. Um, for example, so the, the same prompt, the one on the top right is uh, is uh, V5 of my journey, the one on the V4, quite frankly, I prefer V4. It's just a matter of taste. So it comes down to what you want to achieve, what you like, um, and what you're going to do with it afterwards and how, you, how you're going to transform. Um, that's the part for the all the art side. Then I'm going to switch now to Doc Studio and how you approach this and, and how we integrated some of this in the in the past. Um, and which is one big finding is it's such a game changer that we'd be stupid to ignore it. So I'm going to come back on a, a few different cases. Um, one of them is uh, exploring what um, defect can be. Uh, obviously, defect comes with like a legal side, but obviously providing you get authorization the person uh, who's providing his image. That's something which could be done in the flash days already, although to some kind of a, a success, like the, the shading was always a bit weird. Now you can seamlessly integrate with some libraries and it goes not only really fast, but as you can see on the bottom right, it's extremely uh, powerful. Um, we pushed as well to see if we could make more illustrative, how uh, that's uh, some of our team members, um, what we could do with it. Uh, using some models or some what you call LoRa, which are fine-tuned models. So basically an aesthetic, which is already trained um, to, to see how real-time it could be as well. Uh, those are pre-calculated, but uh, last week I saw that some people were even getting this nearly full-time, uh, real-time, sorry, on the, on the webcam. We explored um, client-facing generative AI uh, content creation by uh, mixing 3D. So, um, using a 3D render as a base. Um, if you're familiar with control net or image to image in this case, uh, we use this shape basically to uh, get the, the, um, the AI to generate visual. And then we apply uh, those textures directly on the model, uh, which can, on the flip side, help us not only do some concepting early in the, in the process, but also apply it directly on the model and integrate this in some uh, uh, layouts and see how it works or directly in the in the project once it's done. Um, another aspect, and I, that's also like how I'm going to conclude on that is uh, animation. How far can we go with animation? Uh, sometimes with more or less success. So as you know, or I mean, or, or don't, but you have uh, some major tools now. So Runway has been around for quite a while, so it's, it's uh, easy to know. Uh, you have PK Labs, which has been around for quite a while, but now we really came publicly since they announced their uh, I think it was a round A, or like even maybe a C, I don't know, I think it's round A, a few months ago, but similar kind of approach. But then you have a lot of others. You have Warp Fusion, you have uh, Zeroscope, you have uh, Deforum, uh, Stable Diffusion, really their own solution. Uh, and pretty much every day you you have new papers which are being released with uh, new possibilities. So this is Warp Fusion, something we tried a few months ago. And once again, I think every kind of a approach is going to give you something totally different, and that depends on uh, the intention, what you're trying to achieve. Uh, at some point, we tried to see how consistent we could be uh, with restyling by using uh, uh, initial uh, frame and doing a style transfer, um, and we got some pretty interesting um, outputs. Um, other project, totally different field. A team from Adept uh, started investigating uh, uh, storytelling. How can you generate children books on the fly, both the story and, and, uh, um, and the imagery? Obviously, now you can use libraries like um, uh, Eleven Labs uh, to generate on the fly the, the sound as well. Uh, but also, moving further, how can you make sure that whatever the input is is safe for your kid, that they can put anything wrong or like there's any mistake? Uh, so an entire uh, regulation system for prompt engineering to make sure that the kid is going to have something safe uh, in front of their eyes. So another industry, um, you can also argue that um, uh, children books is, is already a difficult one, like uh, illustrators aren't really uh, getting paid much. So that's once again a debate. Is it good? Is it you know is it going to be extremely bad for a lot of people? 
uh, and then you know, like the uh, industry is going to just embrace this because it'll be much cheaper for them to produce. So it's difficult because indeed it's tempting, but then we we still have yet to find the right uh, balance. Um, a few months ago, we also started uh, building our own video game, which uh, obviously as a good agency we, uh, with planned work is not finished, but which proved to be an amazing playground. Uh, there's a bit of a, uh, if you if you want to check, you can go on our website and there's uh, um, some blog posts to come back on it, but um, not only we used it for uh, image generation and trying to build the universe and what kind of vibe you want it and what kind of a approach, uh, but also to, uh, 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 create the the the, exact, the actual assets, so from the generation to a, a, a 3D model uh, on each side. So that's that's also really interesting. Uh, or we even push further, like so we had this uh, bedroom. We wanted to see if we could do the entire uh, texturing of the room just using uh, uh, AI. And it was still a lot of manual work, right? I'm pretty sure that in six months from now you'll be able to automate. But for now, we should be retesting. So creating custom workflows like, okay, we model the chair. So how do we uh, texture it? So the way by having different cameras, taking different shots, and then we applying each, each angle separately and then we blending everything. And then doing the same for all objects. So that's what we had in the end, this, uh, this bedroom, which used all those generated assets. Um, but then there was still a lot of manual work. But on the flip side, I think it still went much faster than if we had to do everything, uh, you know, I would say by hand, by um, just texturing and painting every single diffuse texture and every single normal map. Um, another one, uh, we started integrating a lot more AI into our uh, technical and visual process. So one good example is at some point we had to export raw uh, uh, positions from a camera for a WebGL project. So from the Cinema 4D to the WebGL, that was extremely painful to do by hand. And just with a few exchanges with ChatGPT and reiterating and remodifying the script again and again, we managed to get a Python script, which enabled us to actually generate this data and put it directly in WebGL, which saved us days and days and days of work of doing something which is extremely annoying and not really uh, rewarding. It's just figuring out the positions. Um, another project, we had this CD on the bottom left, as you can see, which is huge. Uh, it was awful to run on the computers as well. But it was also impossible to render in WebGL uh, the way it was, and so creating scripts to optimize automatically all the models and retain the shape so that we can then run it in uh, in WebGL. Uh, and I think one of the last ones before the last project, and then I think we might have a few minutes for uh, uh, for Q and A. Um, experiencing further so. On the left side, what you can see is something called Comfy UI. It's a node-based interface, if you're familiar with it. Um, so it's extremely, and I spent a bit of time uh, sitting with it, and quite frankly, I still think it's difficult. But you're plugging those boxes, and they're going to, uh, like a chain, they're going to influence the next one, and so on and so forth. What's interesting is that when you run the process, you can see not only where it's blocking, but also um, you have the output somewhere. You can see what it gives, but it enables you to um, to plug different kind of data models and uh, uh, libraries into something which is not really visual, but at least extremely practical and powerful. And so on the right, we started with an audio wave, um, use this audio wave to create uh, on Cinema 4D, uh, 3D sound effector to have those kind of a building like thing. We using depth map from Cinema 4D and then running the entire output, including depth map into config UI to generate what's on the right. Um, and once again, workflows are infinite. This is what, um, what's amazing. And so I'm going to, to close the projects with one we're working on right now, which is not finished. So it's a really, it's a work in progress, even though shots are not finished, but to show you how far we can go and also what kind of full stack you can get. But we're working on a short film right now. That's the first uh, animatic uh, with some pieces where you can see the animator uh, finish the illustration. We had the next version, which was a little more detailed for the background, but then we built an entire um, workflow, uh, which is using like dozens and dozens of tools to transform a 2D animation uh, into a full uh, render uh, with a, a kind of a claymation stop motion uh, aspect um, using AI. So what's interesting also is that none of this is automatic, of course, there's a lot of manual work 
I love retouching. I love so just taking frame by frame and retouching each frame individually if there's some defects. But we get to a, a quality of production and level of control, which is nearly 100% on this. Like This is not just running one way 20 times and hoping that one is going to come out good. Um, this is the same as you would work traditionally. But blending so many tools to get there. Stable diffusion, complete UI, mid apps for the depth, uh, 2D traditional animation, of course, here. But also like a lot of other things. But once you start building the framework and assembling the different pieces together, it's pretty magic that you can get to uh, to an output like this, which is uh, uh, to us getting to a, a a place where we know that if we had to do this in stop motion or even in 3D, that would be a totally different animal. There's a lot of work which goes into that. Um, hopefully, I can share the, the film in a few weeks normally. Um, and it's uh, been two minutes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we, we hope to get uh, good reactions, but even our side working on this, we're pretty amazed that we can get to that level of uh, fine tuning uh, uh, these days. Um, to conclude, I'm going to use this super famous um, uh, quote Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable, awful word for, me, uh, word for me to say, from magic. Um, I think it's really important because we're really at a unique moment in time uh, where this still feels like it's magic. It's going to go extremely fast, and I think this curve is perfect for that. Um, before AI is just a bit more in our lives, and we just forget about it. It's not magic anymore. Next generation is just going to be born with it. Um, same for us with internet. So, like, you know, my kids is just normal that internet is around. For me, it was still magical uh, when I had my 56K you know, modem doing a shit of noise and, and being extremely slow. So, I think we should enjoy this because that's still magic and, and uh, it's good to see people's reaction until everyone is jaded and goes back to, um, to their life. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's hope that things are going to um, to, um, to get even more interesting or like more regulated. And uh, meanwhile, enjoy this moment. Um, and so this is brought to you by uh, a kind of an attack for you. And don't hesitate to follow me on socials. Uh, this is Twitter. I'm I mean, I have an Instagram handle, but I think uh, and obviously Doc Studio as well. Um, and you can check on Twitter. I think I'm a lot more active on the Twitter account. And that's it. All right. Thanks so much, Harry. That was absolutely amazing. All right. Um, anybody have some uh, questions? All right. Yeah. Kind of uh, very mind blowing. Okay. So I'll I'll ask some questions. Okay. Uh, oh, wait, let's see. Uh, Dylan, you had a question. Do you want to ask it yourself? Do you want to go camera on or do you want me to read it for you? Okay. I'll oh, go. Okay, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I was. <laughs> was oh, no, no, all good. I, I'm going to read the question. Um, <laughs> so uh, Dylan said, thank you for this talk. Uh, great inspiration information. How do you handle file management with all these kind of workflows? The amount of files you're generating is enormous. That's something I'm struggling with at the moment. Uh, nothing, nothing special. We try to. So, if you look at the, the short rebuilding, for example, like in terms of size, I think it's manageable. We don't have actually, you know, humongous files. I think each person, like if you're running a PC and people are doing are running their own process on the PC, they're running the models locally, which can be pretty huge. You have like uh, gigabytes of data that you have to take, which can be complicated. When we're using Web GPU, the benefit is that often it's just hosted directly on there, so you have to manage that. But I would say on our side, it's multi organization. So building a short right now. We have shot names for each shot. So we have like contest folders and we have to make sure that everyone is really organized and keeping track of what's a finished state, what's clean, what's uh, what's where, and then put everything in the right place. But that's just exactly the same as you know running PSDs for years and, and just being organized. Um, so I'm gonna uh Farah had a question. I'm gonna actually kind of adapt yeah. it a little bit. So you know, you showed like sort of a variety of of programs. You know, if someone's just trying to get started in this and they just want to kind of get their feet wet, like what are like the first three that you might suggest? I think, but I mean, obviously the, the easiest to get in is mid journey. Like I think everyone at some point tried it. So it's it's super easy to um to at least try, and you can get as deep as you want. Um, it's still interesting to uh get um to to at least to have a, a feel of what is to work with stable diffusion. And so the best way to do or like the easiest way to me is using Leonardo. Um because their interface is extremely easy to use and there's a free plan. So you can you have credits to get started and do whatever you want without having to commit to anything uh, financially. Um, and then depends on what you want to do. Like uh, 
Sound Design, Eleven Labs is doing uh, is doing great work. They raise a lot of money lately because I think solution is like the best in the market. Um, you have uh, Video Runway, Pika Labs are both um, extremely good solutions to start animating. Um, and we stick to GPT because you know it's it's super handy. And Dali, that could be also considered for text to image. Dali is much better right now at, than all the others um, at understanding language, like plain language. If you describe something, you'll get it. Majority and Leonardo is still pretty cryptic. So you aim for something, but then the V6, V6 of Majority is getting much better at that, but we still little distance. Um, uh, Tyler had a question. Tyler, you want me to ask it for you or do you want to jump on camera? Uh, no, go for it, Josh. Okay, cool. All right. Thanks for joining, Tyler. Um, so uh, one thing among many that I found impressive with this presentation is how it outlines these massive shifts in workflow that are frankly revolutionary for content creation at scale. Agreed. Um, in your rounds of presenting this deck, how have larger brands received this information? I think there's a lot of misinformation circulating. Um which is which is a tough one. So I think everyone is curious right now, but everyone is kind of on the fence as long as legal larger brands, right? It starts with legal, right? As long as legal doesn't say you're clear to go, no one wants to do it. And like last week we had so not not not, uh, <laughs> not giving names on this, but like we had a pitch where like we were asked about the provenance of the data, like how ethical is it, it is. And I said to dig because I've been spending so much time into this that was difficult to um to find something which is 100% ethical. As I mentioned, W Fusion is using, using a library called Lion. Lion is open source, but the scraping of the data is not clear. We don't know, and most likely some copyright material has been used. Majorni, same, 100% sure uh, copyright material is in there. And so I was looking, I found a company which started on that. And then we learned like down the road that other agencies gave back a full concept saying that it was 100% ethical and guaranteed it. And I still, as of today, cannot guarantee that didn't lie. I, I'm 100% sure they lied. If they didn't lie, they were misinformed. There's like, oh, it's open source, so it should be, it should be ethical. And so we basically lost on the pitch where I know that we told the client the truth of what the market was right now, what the risk were, and people get around it. So I think it's such a kind of worms right now when brands are either misinformed or don't know what to do or like on the fence because of the legal side. So I'm, I'm curious to see how it's going to move in the future, but the technical aspect is, I think, blocking a lot of the discussions. Okay, so Kelly has a question. You know, I have a question, but I'm going to just ask you, but personally later. <laughs> um, Kelly, uh, you're you're on, on camera. You want to you want to ask your question? <clears throat> uh, yes, I mean, I, I think my question um, brings out a lot of feelings from a lot of different people. So first of all, thank you for your very humorous deck. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and also thank you for sort of explaining your process because, so I come from landscape architecture and sculpture and I, I've worked on sphere and I've worked on giga projects and kind of done a variety of things. And, you know, I, I hear people talking about themselves as an AI artist and I'm the moron, the person who says you're a moron and rolls your eye, you know, <laughs> because people around me are using programs like mid journey to come up with concepts and ideas. Mm -hmm. where I see you kind of um, creating something, tweaking it, editing it, throwing it back in, sort of like like an artist or a designer would would work. So I was just, you know, someone commented back to me, but that idea of using sort of like in that initial phase, mid journey or something like that to come up with concepts. And I think, aren't we brilliant humans with brilliant minds that come up with more thoughtful ideas that rel relate to a project when we consider it on our own, go through that sort of yeah. design process rather mm -hmm. than throwing the machine, seeing yeah. what that machine spits back and then using that. Yeah, so I agree with you and it depends on how you treat this, but um, for example, sometimes I, I, I read stuff, I'm like, oh, this is chat GPT, like you can, it's a reflex that people are like, okay, I'm going to try to generate something and then you, you, it gets out, but you feel like something is missing. Obviously it's still our responsibility to do that work. But I appreciate with that, and I do like uh, this concept inside is that um, recently I've been saying that I do see, as a, as a human person, as a human being, when you are doing concepting, traditionally without AI, you it's like you have this infinite space with like 
mirror of ideas and you were like a spotlight and your spotlight is pretty it's pretty short right mm -hmm. and you can look at a few at the same time because like just time and you can if i give you two hours you look at, at like 10 maybe if now i give you ai it's like suddenly i just give you a huge floodlight and you don't see 10 at the same time you see 200 at the same time and so to me it changes your position to, from purely uh, and I think it's an ego thing as well as human being like, oh, I, I own that. That's my ID to curator. Now, like if I can see 100 IDs by the time I normally at 10, my position as a, as a creative is to see how many of those 100 IDs are actually relevant. How many make sense? Where do I want to go with that? So I, I think it's relevant if your mindset is, and that's personal, is accurate. And my mindset is Gen, Gen AI can do pretty much anything you want. But then it's still you at the end of the day who's choosing what makes sense, if it's relevant, if it's if it's any good, uh, is your point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same debate at some point people had when photography started to be a thing and then people doing art painting were like, oh, that's not art, you know, it's just pressing a button and then just develop and that's, that's all right. I think what separates the mass from the rest is, is just having a point of view and having a different attitude towards the work. Mm -hmm. And you being... Uh, you said uh, landscaping architect, right? Yeah, I don't do that anymore, but the base is sort of like systems design thinking, right? Yeah. So, like as an artist, I look at at light and consciousness and perception and right, I'm always like tinkering and figuring. So yeah. it feels to me more like I can generate hundreds of ideas really fast. It doesn't mean I can yeah. make a, a picture, Yeah, but I can come up with ideas that relevate re um, relate directly and understand budgets and timelines yep. and right. There's a journey yep. feels to me, but I'm learning, right? This is why yeah, it's, I'm it's, yeah. no, no, I get it. And I get it. Yeah. A Zoom, right? No, 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 it makes sense. It makes sense. I, I was asking yourself because I, I, a lot of different fields are trying to leverage in different ways. I saw recently uh, architecture work where they were doing like uh, dozens, dozens of generations to actually find the, the optimal angle for lighting on the building. And I thought it was amazing. Like this is where like this is solving an actual problem, but also opening new doors in terms of what architecture is going to look like in the future. So I, I think there's ways, but once again, it comes down to what you're going to do with it and, and how far you want to push your own creative process. Makes sense. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Really All right. Good. Well, I, of course, thank you. Henry, th this is an awesome presentation. I think we're out of time. I mean, I, I I appreciate the optimism. I know that also like as agency owners, we both know this is like totally threatening in some ways too. Um, and like, and I, and I, but, but I think, you know, I, I think the, the idea of embracing these technologies and exploring these technologies and seeing what you could actually make with these technologies is super, super inspiring. Um, so thanks again for, uh, for joining us. Uh, hope to catch you in Salt Lake city. Maybe we'll go skiing or something. Um, yeah, and you. thank you everybody for uh, joining us here at future spaces. Um, Check us out on social. See you again next week. Uh, again, Henry, thanks so much, man. Really, truly, truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. All right. See y'all.